Movie House Cinemas, proud sponsors of Conversations with Jerry Kelly. Treat yourself to a movie. Relax in VIP recliner seating without the VIP price tag. At Cityside, Glen Gormley, Macara, and Coleraine. Enjoy the show. Good evening and welcome to Conversations with me, Jerry Kelly. Now, for over six decades, my guest tonight has written songs for everyone, from Cliff Richard to Sinead O'Connor, from Elvis Presley to the Dubliners, from the Bay City Rollers to Billy Connolly. He has amassed over 100 silver, gold and platinum discs. He has won five Ivor Novello Awards, a Meteor Award and a Grammy nomination, as well as receiving the gold badge from the British Academy of Songwriters, Composers and Authors. He has played for US Presidents. He has sold out Carnegie Hall in New York. He's been everywhere. Would you please welcome the greatest Irish composer of his generation, the wonderful <laughs> Phil Coulter. <laughs> Recognize yourself and all that? There's life in the old dog yet. There is I'm not plenty of life in the old there's dog yet. There's a turn in the mints yet, yes. <laughs> uh, I'm, not, I'm not finished just quite yet. What keeps you going today, Phil? Because you know, you, you've achieved it all. There's not much left to achieve, surely. The, the alternative doesn't appeal to me, Jerry. I mean, the alternative of retiring, you know, and staying home drinking cups of tea and reading the paper and driving my wife crazy, you know. And she'd be chasing me out to do something in the garden or, or you know, or, or, you know, go down and fix that garden shed. Um, I'd sooner be doing what I do, you know. Um, for me, I'm constantly aware of the fact that I've been, I've been privileged and blessed that for, uh, well, close on 60 years, I've made a living for my talent, you know. I, I made a living for something that, 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 that I enjoy doing. Something that, that, that um, you know, um, I, have, I have long since given up on the pursuit of happiness. I think that's a pointless exercise because happiness is an ongoing, you know, happiness doesn't exist like in a, in a, you know, in a long term. I think happiness, you know, if, if there are moments when, uh, you know, all of the all of the planets are in line, you know, and everything. Say, you know, at a family reunion or whatever it might be, and everyone has just hit that high. That's a moment of happiness. Yes. I've taught myself to kind of treasure that, slow that down, you know, and, and make that. That's those moments of happiness are ones that you treasure and take away. But an, an ongoing situation, I think, if you can get some uh, fulfillment in your professional life and contentment in your personal life, then you're in good shape. Yeah, you know. What gave you the, the, the thought in your head that you could go to London, a young fella coming from Derry, go to London and make it in the music scene there? What gave you that confidence? Well, it, 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 it happened uh, when I was at Queen's. Um, and my, on my first uh, term up at Queen's, um, I, was, I was really disappointed by what the music that I heard, you know, and the dances, because they were either like, they were playing Dixieland, the White Eagles used to play Dixieland, or when there was dances, it was like a, a dance band. They were all sitting down, reading, yes. reading orchestrations. Yes. Um, and all kind of tired, you know, like middle-aged guys who couldn't, you know, didn't really care. They were just getting a night's wages. Um, but there was no excitement, you know. Meanwhile, outside of Queens and in, in, in the world of pop music, um, in Ireland, you had the show band thing that was breaking. That was a revolution. And then you had like Fats Domino and you had Little Richard and Elvis Presley. That was happening in the real world. So I thought, wow, the only way I'm going to get some pop music here that does if I start a band. I mean, that's the kind of arrogance and ignorance of youth at the same time. Okay. I can do this. Yeah. So I started a band. So uh, for, for my four years at Queen's, I always had a little group of some sort. In my last year, um, uh, a, a man called Sean Armstrong, who was then head of the PTQ, the, the magazine to do with the Rag Week. PTQ, I'd yeah. forgotten about PTQ. Remember PTQ? <laughs> yes. Sean Armstrong, anyway, he was in charge of this kind of stuff and tried to dream up notions as a fundraiser for the Rag Week. He came to me and said, Phil, what about a student record? Would you be, would you be up for that? I said, oh, I'm your man. Absolutely, I can do that. Um, so I had, I had written, uh, in, my, in the previous summer, my summer job was working as a red coat in Butlins. And I, I wrote this song while I was over there, a song called Foolin' Time, right? Um, so when Sean Armstrong said about the student record, I'm your man. So with my, I had a little three-piece band, 
And there was a guy in Queens uh, studying electronics called Peter Lloyd. You may have encountered him. And his, 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 what he brought to the party was he owned a tape recorder. So he was, he was our man. <laughs> so he became the recording engineer. This is true. So on the appointed day, um, we moved into a, one of the university common rooms. I was really impressed because Peter Lloyd had moved it. He put cushions over the windows. It put, it put tables up on their sides, you know, to that kind of t- sound separation. He had the drummer behind the tables and he had me behind this. And I thought, wow, this is the big time. <laughs> um, so we recorded this song that I had written the previous the summer, um, Fool in Time. And the B-side was, was a, a medley of, of, of tunes from Wagner as a nod to the fact that I was supposed to be studying music at the same time. This was my, this was my nod to Professor Cranmer. There's a bit of Wagner in here, boss. Um, so, uh, Fool in Time, we released as a student record. Um, and that probably sold, I don't know, maybe a thousand records. But it was great because it got a lot of airtime, you know, got a lot of a lot of profile. And of course, me and and my, my three buddies in the band, we strolled about Queens like rock stars. Yes. You know, we thought we cracked it now. Uh, but that soon faded. Then that summer, my gig was working up in the Great Southern Hotel in Bundoran with my little three piece band. And one night, the Capital Show Band, who were then top of the pile, they were one of the top three. There was the Miami, there was the Royal, there was the Capital. Butch Moore. Uh, yeah, Butch Moore. I got word that from one of the guests that uh, there was a famous kind of place for a lot for a, a lock and a late drink in Bundoran uh, called the Allingham Arms and he said I'm down having a late drink the Capital Show Band are coming and he said they're bringing their instruments I think there might be a bit of a session Whoosh! I'm down there like in jig time and I'm sitting listening to the Capital for, for like half an hour I'm drinking, drinking my pint and then Eamon Monaghan the piano player went to the loo and I thought it's one of those moments you know one of my moments I said Coulter, this is your shot. This is your, you've got to have the courage. So I went to, to Des Kelly and I said, would you mind if I sat in on the piano? He said, can you play? I said, well, it's my gig. I'm playing up on the great drawing. He said, well, give us a shot. Great. So I sat in and spent one of the happiest hours of my life uh, because I, I'm a student. These Capital Showman are major stars yeah. and they formed when they were at UCD. So I, I could kind of relate to those guys. Really loved it. And we were having a drink after the music finished and they said they were playing up uh, they were going up to the Great Southern Hotel to play golf the following morning, and they said, "Well, maybe meet you for a cup of coffee," which happened. Again, it was again one of those moments. Uh, I brought my copies of Fool in Time" by <laughs> Phil Coulter and the Gleeman, and I handed one out to each of the band, whether they wanted it or not. Right. So that was just, I was I was delighted because now the Capital Show Band had in their hands my record. Months went past, and I'm back in Derry for a weekend um, on a Friday night. My mother's making me a stew or something for my dinner. And the phone goes. The phone was in the hall. The, the coldest place in the house, of course, in a terrace house. I always thought the phone was there to let the neighbours see that you had a phone. <laughs> you know, it had to be visible from the front door. Anyway, my mother goes out to answer the phone. She comes back in. She said, there's a call for you here from Dublin. Like, what could be that important, you know? That somebody from Dublin could be, what's going on? So it was Des Kelly of the Capital Showman who said that um, they loved the song and would it be okay with me if they recorded it as their first single? Really? I said, could you say that again, please? He said, would it be okay with you if recorded as your first single? I thought I had died and gone to heaven. That, mo- that was the start. That was the moment right then. That changed my life. Wow. You eventually went off to London. Yeah. You worked in Denmark Street, Tin Pan Alley, Tin they, they Pan called. Alley. And your job at that stage was literally to go into the office of a Monday morning at mm. nine o'clock, leave at five or six or whatever it was, writing songs. Mm. It was like a conveyor belt of songs coming out of you. Well, there's a lot of that that still exists. I still turn up for work at 10 o'clock, Jack. Do you still consider it work? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I still, it's, yeah, it's my career um, and I take it seriously. You know, I mean, people say, how, could, how have you endured for like uh, 60 something years? Yeah. I turn up for work on Monday morning. But in Denmark Street, that was a process of learning my craft. You know, it was an apprenticeship. You know, even somebody who's going to be a plumber has to spend those years learning how to be a plumber. Yeah, yeah. As a songwriter, there's no such thing as a born songwriter. You know, you've got some of the skills, but somebody has to teach you how to put those all together. What's wrong with songwriting today is nobody's been taught how to put those things together. Those TikTok songs that you hear, you know, that are that are all over the place. Um, you, you're not going to hear them in another three no, or four years, no. you know, because they're they're instantly, you know, make an instant impact and then they're instantly forgettable, yeah. you know. But, but I mean, I, did you have to sit at the desk back then and just write songs? This was the deal. Every second Friday, we went into the little demo studio in the behind the post the post room, the boils of the of the of the building, and record six new songs. That's words, music, and an arrangement for the little in-house four or five piece band. 
Then the following Monday, we took those six demos and played them to our boss, who was, you know, a real old time music publisher, had, had, had mentored people like Kennedy and Carr, um, Lionel Bart, uh, who wrote Oliver, etc., um, and himself had written that smile, low your heart, is it? Oh, yeah. So he knew, he knew the game, he knew, the, he, knew, he knew about songwriting, and that was the mentoring period that he would analyze what our attempts at songwriting and as often as not throw them in the bin and tell us why he was throwing them in the bin because they were either too long, too short, not, not, not catchy enough or whatever it might be, not enough economy with the words or with the music. Kept telling me that, Mr. Coulter, I know you've been to university, knew a lot about music, you don't have to prove it every time you write a pop song. <laughs> that was a good lesson to learn. Good lesson to learn. And I, I, I still remember the, 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 after one of those, those conversations, Jimmy called me over to the window overlooking Denmark Street and there's a traffic jam uh, and at the top of the tra traffic jam there's a lorry. Jimmy said, look at that, see the man driving the lorry? I said, yeah. He said, when you're writing a song, don't be thinking about your music professors or your, mu or your, your music lectures at the university. It's that Think guy. about him. Yeah. Think about him. 100%. That's the man that you're trying to appeal. Well, you obviously thought about him because come 1967 you struck gold. Eurovision Song Contest. That was that was that was the breakthrough. It was it was probably the most dramatic way to arrive on the scene as an announcer arrived as a songwriter because the UK had never won yeah, the Eurovision. Yeah. Had never won. Had done very poorly, in fact. You know, um, that was that was uh, yeah that was in the time too when when the Eurovision really was a song contest. You know, sometimes I despair of what's happening now. To me, when I look at it now, it's it's a television extravaganza, and I think. Like the hairdresser is nearly as important as the songwriter these days, you know. I mean, it's about it's about the whole presentation. Yes, the costume designer. Yeah, and about the routines and the and the flashing lights. Yeah. But they're a bit very. F Here's the thing about the Eurovision. Here's th the ultimate verdict in the Eurovision, Jerry, is that it's been too long since the Eurovision produced a global hit song. Water years. Waterloo was probably the, the last, last one. Yeah, that's the last song that would be known globally. Yeah, you know, that because I mean. Fair play to I me, mean, Azerbaijan or whatever. They're lovely people, I'm sure. But I mean, their idea of a pop song is not mine. And so those those songs it just disappear, you know. Well, there are two songs that are still about. One's Puppet on a String, yeah. which you won in 1967. You then went on to do Cliff Richard yeah. and Congratulations in 1968. You were second then. Yeah, by didn't one quite win it. You didn't quite win it. By one point, we we were we were. It gets more painful than that. We were in we were in uh, we were in the Royal Albert Hall and. Uh, we were, we were like coming into the last couple. We were six six points ahead, and we've been getting like full marks from from right, left, and centre all the way through. So much so that the floor manager, uh, the BBC floor manager in the Royal Albert Hall, came down and said, "Right, lads, backstage to, to get the award." He, but it's a done deal as far as he's yeah. concerned. Bill Martin, uh, who was my partner then, very Scottish and very uh, very superstitious, he refused to get up. And the boy had actually grab him and bring him. So we're backstage waiting to say, and the winner is, congratulations. Except somebody didn't read the script because uh, Germany voted and gave seven votes to Spain and none to us. Okay. So instead of being six ahead, we're now one behind. Right. And that's how you lost it. That's how we lost it. And all this talking, as you noticed, we have a, we have a piano in the studio. I noticed that, Jerry. Maybe funny. you might uh, sit behind it. If there's a budget, I'll do it, Jerry. There is a budget. Okay, <laughs> we'll take a break. Afterwards, Phil will be behind the piano. See you in a couple of minutes. And welcome back. As you can see, my special guest tonight is Phil Coulter and the maestro himself is back in his natural habitat behind the piano. Phil, earlier before the break, we were talking about the 60s and 70s and about uh, Puppet on a String and congratulations. Seeing you're at the piano, could you give us a little reminder of how those two went? And the audience might even join in. Who would know? I, I, have, a, I have a soft spot um, for the Eurovision because that's what, that's what um, kind of gave me my break. I, I think I was telling you, when I left Queen's, my parents wanted me to go back to yes. summer. And my mother was praying day and night. Uh, she was lighting candles, offering up novenas, um, and uh, saying rosaries that our son wouldn't end up living in the streets. So I'm in, I'm in London now and I'm battling for those first two years to try and get a, uh, get a foothold. And why not? I mean, you know, here am I from, like from a terraced house in Derry, uh, trying to get a break into the international music scene. Um, so when the Eurovision came, I'd, uh, 
that kind of changed everything. Uh, so I have a soft spot for these two-week songs because not only did they get the bank manager off my back, they got my poor mother off her knees. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. I wonder if one day that you'll say that you care if you say you love me badly. I'll gladly be there like a puppet on a string. Just like a merry-go-round With all the fun of the fair One day I'm feet down on the ground Then I'm up in the air Are you having me on? Tomorrow will you be gone? If one day that you say that you care If you say you love me madly I'll gladly be there Like a puppet on a string Like a puppet on a <laughs> Congratulations And celebration When I tell everyone, everyone That you're in love with me Congratulations and jubilations I want the world to know I'm happy as can be Congratulations and celebrations When I tell everyone that you're in love with me Congratulations and jubilations I want the world to know I'm happy as can be I want the world to know I'm happy as can be <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, that kick-started you. You were, you were off and running at that stage, but it wasn't always going to be Eurovision. You turned your eye to the pop scene and you got involved with the Bay City Rulers. How did that happen? Uh, there was a there was a, a kind of a revolution in in, uh, in the in the, the record buying public, where before record labels and music publishers believed that the kids buying uh, pop records um, were like eighteen, nineteen, twenty. Then gradually that age group dropped, uh, and then became the arrival of the teeny bopper uh, market. So instead of being like eighteen, nineteen, twenty. Kids buying singles were like eight, nine, and ten, yeah. ten, eleven, and twelve, yeah. twelve. So there, that was being catered for largely by American acts like uh, Donny Osmond, the Jackson Five, um, those kind of acts, you know, who were all kind of well scrubbed in America. We thought, well, if that market is there, what, 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 what's needed here is a homegrown teeny bopper uh, band, you know, that that can can cater for this audience. So we kind of cast our net around and found. Uh, the Bay City Rollers had had one minor hit a year or so, maybe 18 months before that, a song called Keep On Dancing. Yeah. Um, which had been a minor hit, kind of number 12 or whatever. Um, and uh, the record label were very keen to kind of give them another shot. So they asked us if we would take on the Bay City Rollers. Now, that seems like a bit of a gift now to say take on the Bay City Rollers, but they had had a shot and they had, they had, they had failed. They had, they, they had done three more follow-up records that didn't happen. So in the music industry, it's often less of a difficulty to break a brand new act than trying to breathe life into an act that's, that's had a go and died. But there was, so we were in two minds really until we went to meet the Bay City Rollers. Now they weren't the most talented of, of lads, but they had this conviction. I mean conviction that it was only a matter of time before they were going to be stars, you know. And they had that great energy about them, that absolute um, confidence that sooner or later they were going to be on top of the pops. And that was the kind of energy that we harnessed. Now, to tell you the truth, in the studio there weren't much cop, you know. Um, I think, to be truthful, I think for, for most of the hits that I made, it was session players who were playing, who were oh, playing the guitars. Oh, wasn't even them. No. And Les McEwen, as often as not, those early Bay City single uh, hits, uh, like uh, Shang a Lang, I said, was... Uh, the session players playing the guitars and Les McEwen and me doing the doing the vocals. Really? Vocals. Oh yes. Yeah. You see, well, on the other side of that, you're a wordsmith. You, your choice of words and lyrics are 
superb. What did you come up with for the Bay City Rulers? Shang Alang. Mm -hmm. Shang Alang. Mm -hmm. Well, that, well, I was never going to win a Pulitzer Prize like for for uh, for, for English language, but you see, it's horses for courses. You know, you write a song like um, you're talking about even a wordsmith and being sensitive about words. You write a song like Scorn Not His Simplicity. You got to judge every word. You know, you got to judge that very carefully because that's that's a serious song about a serious subject. Then, but you park that now. Now. As I was saying earlier on, my training was to be able to move like between yeah, the different genres, genres, you know. Yeah. So now you leave Scorn Out of Simplicity, serious song, grown up um, uh, substance. Now uh, you're in pop music, and with a teeny bopper uh, act, you, your parameters change, you know. You've got two minutes and 40 seconds to do your business. So you keep that as, as direct and as simple as you possibly can. So Shang Alang, well, I'll have to tell you stories. A couple, couple of years ago, uh, Les McEwen, who was the lead singer, called me up. God rest his soul, he's since passed away. But he called me up to say, Phil, uh, I'm on tour. I'm doing a European tour with Les McEwen's Bay City Rollers, which he kind of kept touring with. And he said, we're playing a music festival in Leopardstown in Dublin. It'd be great if he came to the show. He said, it'd be even better if you'd join us on stage and we would sing one of your hits. So, um, uh, on the appointed day, I drive up to the, the artist's entrance to, to Leopardstown. And there's a big security guard, big dubbed security guard, and he comes out. So I lower the window, and he looks and he goes, "Ah, Jesus, it's yourself." I said, "It's myself." He said, uh, "Ask me what I was doing." I said, "I was there to the base city roller." Turns out he's the base city roller. The rollers, God, gee, the rollers. And he said, uh, "I said actually talking to Les, I might go on stage, um, do a song with him, do a song with the rollers." Jesus, right? What would you do? He said, "I said, uh, I don't know, maybe Shang Alang." Bleeding classic, he says. <laughs> <laughs> we would rip it up, we would rock it up, roll it over and lay it down. We would shake it, we were breaking it, we'd really jump into the shine of sound of the music. Hey, hey, rock it to the music. Rockin' to the music a rockin' every night and day Hey, hey, we sang Shang Alang And we ran with the gang Singing do up be do be do it We were all in the news With our blue suede shoes And our dancing the night away We sang Shang Alang And we ran with the gang Do up be do be do it With a jukebox playing in it Saying that music like ours couldn't die With a jukebox playing And everybody saying That music like ours couldn't die <laughs> Thank you You mentioned the different genres and you mentioned from that, you, you, you always, your heart was always back in Ireland and certainly in, in that sort of folk scene. Mm. You talked about Scorn Not His Simplicity that Luke Kelly sang. Yeah. And nobody sings that song quite like Luke Kelly, I think. Well, there are two, there are two versions of that song that would be, uh, would be um, close to my heart. And I think I'm very, I'm very blessed that I, what I would call two of the best voices that this island ever produced, uh, I chose to sing that song. One was Luke Kelly, you're right. And I thought that was the definitive version. And it's been sung by lots of other people, recorded by lots of other people, um, which I have to say, um, it always delights me. You know, I mean, I, a singer can pay no greater compliment to a songwriter than to sing or to record one of his songs. So they may not all be great versions, yeah. but at the same time, I'm, I'm glad that, that people have, singers think enough of the song to sing it. But Luke's, I thought, was the definitive version until I was producing an album with Sinead O'Connor. Yes. And... Um, she asked to do the song. So Luke's version is very, you know, it's very Luke Kelly. You know, it's very declamatory. And, and you know, that voice that he has, very powerful. Sinead's, as you would imagine, is very fragile, very fragile, very sensitive, much quieter. So between the two of them, um, you know, it's a great compliment that the two best voices, I think, in this country chose to sing that song. Mm -hmm. What was the story behind that film? The story was, um, my first son was born with Down syndrome. And... In the weeks and months that followed, uh, to be honest, uh, it was as much a therapy for myself, Jerry, to try and process all of that. I mean, I was uh, I was twenty two years of age. You know, it was a, it was a big thing to cope with, and I was far from home. I was in London, 
uh, well, recently married and just trying to find my feet, you know, living in uh, renting a flat in in Cricklewood in London, where all the parties, uh, you know, congregated. So I was I was not very sophisticated, not very well travelled, certainly not very mature. Um, and so to be able to handle something like that dropping on your lap was a big challenge. Um, was a big challenge, and I, m- my wife was able to handle it much more readily than I was. I, I learned at an early age that women have got that strength and that ability to cope with those kind of challenges much more than men do. I really do think that. So part of my uh, trying to, to come to terms with all that was to write a song about it. Um, uh, as I say, just to try to, to, to process it, you know. I mean, Where, where I, did you get that line, scorn not his simplicity? It's a beautiful line. Yeah. I, I, I can't tell you where exactly it came from, um, but it was... It's, it seemed up to me, you know, in, in Ireland we call, a, 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 or we used to call a, a, a mentally challenged child a simple, oh, he's a simple yeah, child. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, that, hence the simplicity. You know, people people can't quite get their hand. Why simplicity? Because we always called, like, a backward child, he was simple, yeah. you know. So scorn out his simplicity was to do with that that definition of what, what we used to call a simple child. Would you give us a little verse, just a couple? golden hair yet eyes that show the emptiness inside do we know can we understand just how he feels or have we really tried see him now as he stands alone and watches children play a children's game simple child looks almost like the others, yet they know he's not the same. Scorn not his simplicity, but rather try to love him all the more. Scorn not his simplicity, oh no. All these years later, is it still tough to sing? Yeah, you 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 kind of find a place, you know. You find a space in your in your in your head to to you you don't you 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 can't relive every every night to sing that song. You can't relive, you know, the the the, the sensitivities. Um, you just find, kind of find a place in your professional uh, outlook that that you perform. Mm-hmm. Just you wrote a beautiful one about your father. The same. Thing. Well, funny enough, you know, that, that, I was just going to say sometimes that song about my dad, the old man. And normally, I can get through that. Um, until I'm doing a gig in Derry. Really? Yeah. And then I can see my dad up in the first row of the balcony. Wow. Yeah, he always came to my gigs. Um, yeah, that's that sometimes catches me out. Um, to be truthful, um, it's it's more difficult for me to do a gig in Derry than it is in Carnegie Hall. Why? Because all the memories coming out of the woodwork, and you know, all the memories coming out of the woodwork like that, um, and some of the other ones of, you know, lost members of the family, and you know when you're when you're in your home place, they're the kind of things that crowd in on you. Um, but again, those are the things that that I suppose you know that's 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 part of the tapestry that that you to write the music in the first place. And well, you're obviously a dairy man through and through, okay. and you wrote the most beautiful song anyone could ever write about their city, the town I love so well. How long did it take you to write that film? Oh, long. And, and what were the problems with it? Well, um, as we all know. As we, I mean, this is something I have to explain like when I'm abroad you know, to what, about the troubles of the North that we know what the troubles of the North were <coughs> and going back to Derry during that period and just seeing the effect and you've all examined you've all seen it in your own time the effect that the troubles had is just kind of killing the spirit you know I mean people were walking in Derry with like slumped shoulders there's that re- air of resignation you know um, and when you hear stories like at the Christmas time um there was a pal of mine whose daughter was teaching kids like a little primary school and she asked them to write, the, to do a little painting of the nativity scene and this little little kid 
like draws the the, uh, the the stable and the baby Jesus and Mary and Joseph and the, the shepherds and, and this little black thing up in the sky. The, the teacher said, that's all lovely. Mary. What's this up here? She said, that's the helicopter. <laughs> no, you know, it's funny now, but it was sad when you think yeah. that was part of the landscape. You know, kids of that age were going to school with a helicopter mm-hmm. overhead, mm-hmm. you know. So with that, that was a traumatic, uh, had a traumatic effect. On the, I felt anyway on, on the city and I thought, this is something which is so historic, so traumatic, that it should be captured in a song. And then I, I thought that for a long time. And then I thought, well, what are you waiting for? Who are you waiting for to write this song? You know, like you've lived through it. You understand it, you know, rather than have somebody from outside of our part of the world writing a song about the troubles, mm-hmm. you know, not understanding it. You know, we all get a bit resentful. They don't understand like what makes us tick up here, you know. Um, so I thought if anybody's going to write a song about that kind of situation, it should be somebody who's lived through it. But it's took you a long while. The melody, I think, probably a couple of weeks, but I, I, it was months going through the lyric because, bear in mind, this was a very highly charged time in, in, in our part of the world. Um, and I, I, the last thing I wanted to do was, was throw any fuel on the flames. I mean, for example, with a few wrong chosen words, you know, you know taking on the undertaking of writing a song about the troubles, with a few wrong chosen words, wrong chosen images, could have tilted it over to becoming a rebel song. Yes. You know, very easily. Yes. And Christ knows the last thing we need is another rebel song. Especially back then, we certainly didn't need one. So that's the last thing that I wanted. So I've, I, I honed the lyric again. I would go back and say, no, that, that's not right. It just does, it jars a little bit, so I took it out. So I polished and polished that for months, months, and most of a year, I suppose. Could you play some? Yeah. A verse or two? <laughs> I will always see the town that I have loved so well, where our school played ball by the gas yard wall, and we laughed through the smoke and the smell. Going home in the rain, running up. The dark lane, past the jail, and down behind the fountain. Those were happy days in so many, many ways in the town I loved so well. Now the music's gone. But they carry on For their spirits been bruised Never broken They will not forget But their hearts are set On tomorrow and peace once again For what's done is done And what's won What's lost is lost and gone forever. I can only pray for a bright, brand new day in the town I love. you become the performer because you know we started off at the start you were a songwriter a composer when did you break out into the limelight well i tell you there are two kinds of performers there's the kind of performers who were born to sing born to dance like robbie williams yes know? he was he was born to do nothing else and then there are kind of performers by accident like me you know i was completely happily making my my, my living as a songwriter as a record producer and arranger conductor whatever until the success of classic tranquility yeah and Sea of Tranquility. I mean, those were two albums which um, completely changed my life, you know. Uh, I'd set out, I'd set out, here's the story. Uh, one Christmas, we have a house in Donegal up in Buncrana, 
and um, we had a couple of uh, a couple of a couple of American friends of mine who were coming to spend Christmas in Ireland. So I thought to give them the whole Irish Christmas experience. So while well, we're getting the logs in for the fire and the turkey and the, the ham in for the eat and the drinks in for the for the bevy, I thought um, music needs some music now to play in the background. And I thought what I, what I want is some nice Irish music, but but play tastefully. You know, I didn't want the Dubliners, I didn't want the Chieftains, I didn't want the Fury, but I didn't want any words. I just wanted that flavour of great Irish melodies in the background. You know, done done with a bit of with a bit of style, and I couldn't find it. They didn't exist. I mean, they were recordings by the RTE Concert Orchestra. Yeah. Of course, they were Northern Ireland brother. It was David Curry's. But that wasn't what I wanted. I knew what I wanted to hear, which was, you know, those big melodies, um, just singing out. Uh, so that was that, that planted the, 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 the seed in my head. Then I was, I was, I produced an album with Joe Dolan. Uh, and at the, at the final cut of the, of the, of the commercial was for KTEL Ireland, who were in the business of producing uh, promoting records through television, right? So um, I had a conversation with with the boss man in in, uh, in Cape Town. Said, "Listen, I have this idea of a piano and orchestra, uh, just playing Irish tunes. Is that something that would work on television?" I knew that that by itself, people weren't going to dash into the record stores just with a buy. I knew that it. I had to find some way of getting it out there to let people would be aware of it because I'm not a pop song. You know, I'm not a pop. Ooh, I'm not a pop star. Uh, I did have any track record as a recording artist. So I said, it needs to be on television. This is true. And uh, the guy, Brendan Harvey was his name. He said, it's a great idea, Phil. But he said, it's the end of September. This needs to be out for Christmas. We've run out of time. He said, how quickly could you turn this around? I mean, I really need this. Do you know what to get it into? I said, um, if you make me a commitment that you're going to put this on TV, I will deliver this album. Signed, sealed and delivered in three weeks. Yeah. So I had to write it, write the arrangement, and record it all with. And I did. I made that deadline. It went on. It went on television. They gave it a good um, campaign on television, and it went through. The it was huge. Mm. I think it's the biggest selling album ever in Ireland. Certainly, was, yeah. there was a some told us that every third every third household in Ireland has got a copy of that of that record. That was a challenge then, Jerry Kelly, because when you get a an unexpected hit like that, um, the thing about <laughs> the thing about the music industry, the highway of the music industry is littered with the carcasses of one hit wonders. Yes. And I didn't want to be one of them. So the, the, the follow-up is the real challenge. Um, now, he, the temptation was having had this huge hit with Classic Tranquility, made in a very modest studio with a very modest budget. Uh, the temptation was, now we have a big hit. Let's go, go big. to Abbey Road yeah. and get the, get the LSO and yeah. go, go, go all out for this. And I thought, no, let's go back to the same studio, same players, and let's try and... Ca- whatever it was on that first album worked, so let's not try and reinvent the wheel. So we were back to the same studio, same limited budget, and made uh, Sea of Tranquility, which outsold Classic Fact. That didn't they? So it proved the point. Play something for us from. Um, there's so many. I know. I, there's so, um, uh, well, I'll tell you, the first track that I recorded was this. I make the point. This is a tune that's been recorded a million times. The trick was to do it in a different way. This is the Phil Coulter. This side. is the Phil Coulter.
That is, that is. When you play the piano, I know what you're playing the piano, and that's why it's those little touches you put in yourself that makes it the Phil Coulter recording. Well, it's not an easy thing to have a style as a piano. No. Because, you know, a piano is a piano, and, you know, it all, all sounds the same. You play that, 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 I mean, you know, 20 different piano players play. So you have to you have to try and bring something to it that, that makes yours identifiable. Yeah, to do. I can't tell you what it is because it's just it's it's an accruing of, of a lot of different things. Well you have it. Whatever it is, you have right. it. If I haven't got it by now, Jerry, I'm in big trouble. <laughs> uh, those two records, you said how massive they were in Ireland, those two albums. Every lift all around the world must have had those at the back of a lift. I know. Because that's all you heard was something from I Tranquility. Know. It was a great story. Um there's a, a pal of mine. My when it, 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 it absolutely true. If I was going out to dinner, like in in Dublin, and didn't want to listen to myself playing the piano all night over the PA, my only choice was to go to an Indian restaurant. That was my only escape. <laughs> but anyway, um, this is pal of mine who's, who's a commercial traveller, right? Jerry. His job would be to travel the country, uh, visit his clients, and get get his orders and whatever. And he said to me, he said, "Jesus, that plink." De he called that. He said, that plink de plink followed me everywhere. I choked you, cold. There's no peace. <laughs> anyway, so he said, like, I'd, for example, I'd be, I'd be doing my, my calls at someone like Chew and like One Horse Town and, and Gold and listen to all the banter from the, the clients. Get to, go back to the hotel, knackered, have a shower, be looking forward to a nice quiet dinner down in the dining room. He said, he'd sit down, be looking at the menu the next thing. I said, there was no escape from you, your plink de plink. So then he's, he, he's, he's given, taken the wife away for a bit of a while. He lets her take a holiday. She said, like, we're going for a week to the Canary Islands, I'll book it. She gets to the hotel. We'll have to fly Aer Lingus. I'm not flying any of those charter flying Aer Lingus. Okay. So they got to board the Aer Lingus flight and as they're putting their bags up on the shelf, <laughs> it gets worse. It gets worse. They, on the second day there, Jerry, my pal, goes to the manager and said, listen, I need to impress the wife a little bit. I've been working very hard. So he said, is there a, is there a restaurant, you know, a really romantic restaurant with nice Spanish food, nice Spanish decor, and nice Spanish guitar music around the opposite? Because, Senor, I have the perfect place. Five minutes in a taxi outside the town, you're beautiful. You are on a cliff overlooking the water. The moonlight will be in the water. You will hear the lovely Spanish music, and the food is to die for. I book for you. So the next day out they go, and uh, it's everything your man has said. The moon is on the water. It's all the beautiful Spanish music coming over the tape. They sit down at the venue, and the chef proprietor comes out. He says, Mr. Mr. Maguire, I, you're from Ireland. I love Ireland. I'm, you're very welcome to my restaurant. Anything I can do for you, make it more, more pleasant, please let me know. He said, I'm, I'm so happy you're here. And off he goes, unknown to my pal, the chef proprietor had trained in the Great Southern Hotel in Bundorn. So the next thing is the Spanish music. And it, <laughs> <laughs> no escape. No escape. We talked about how important the lyrics were on the town I love so well. <coughs> How important were the lyrics in Ireland's Call? Pro equally, equally as important. Equally as important. Because the challenge there was to write a sporting anthem for the rugby squad that, that could be comfortably sung by supporters and, and, uh, and uh, fans alike, be they from the north or the south. There, there was an uncomfortable situation for many years where uh, within the squad, uh, there would have been a lot of players from Ulster, and still are, of course. Um, uh, and so, when I run the vein, the, the, the soldier song would be sung. For those guys, um, I would try to explain to people, so for those guys, that's not their national anthem. You know, they come from a community who perceive themselves to be British. For them, all, uh, God say, the Queen is their anthem. Um, and, you know, that's, whether some people don't like it or not, you have to respect that. So... I was called into a meeting with ARFU and they said, we need to address this, this, uh, this situation. Um, I was telling Jerry the story that um, they started to realise that something had to be done about this situation. Um, when in the first Rugby World Cup in Australia in the, in the late 1980s, uh, Willie Anderson, uh, Big Willie, who was one of that squad, told me the story himself, that the previous week there had been a car bombing um, and a, a high court justice had been, had been killed. Some of the players were driving in the other direction, they were they were injured as well. So it was deemed to be not appropriate to play the soldier song. So they 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 thought about what can we do uh, as an alternative. Um, Willie Anderson suggested Danny Boy, which would have been not a bad choice. But somebody in his in his kit bag had got a, you're going to love this had got a cassette of James Last, The Rose of Tralee. Mm -hmm. So for the Irish anthem, they played The Rose of Tralee by James Last. Now it's a lovely song, but it's not as like a song you want to no, go to war with. No, you know? no. So. They called me and said, "We need a song that's gonna that's gonna cross over." That was the time when 
hands across the border and all inclusiveness was the whole thing. So um, that was my commission to write a song that would be kind of universally accepted. I think, I think the smart move on the, on the part of the IRFU was to pick somebody from here. Pick somebody Rather from the, the north, south, yeah. Who would understand, and yeah. you know, would understand the nuances. But there must have been words and things that you couldn't say. Like I well, could, that's part of it, you know. Part, you, you would have an antenna, we all know what that is. There's, you, for example, if you're writing a song, you couldn't say, and united we'll go forward, because somebody going, wait a minute. Yeah, yeah. You know, we're not united. Are we all out? Yeah. Yeah, you know. So, exactly. So, you had to sail, you know, I'd sail around those. And um, that was that proved to be one of the tricky things. To say like a thirty-two county Ireland, you couldn't say that because that's really what you know. That's going to get some going to offend some people. So the uh, that again, the, the the tune came readily enough, but the word was, that was the, the challenge to make to make sure you pick the right the, the right words. Um, and the key to to saying a whole of Ireland without saying thirty-two counties or United Ireland was the four proud, proud provinces, provinces, not the four proud Protestants. <laughs> um, yeah. but it takes a six-year-old from Cork to believe there's only four proud provinces. <laughs> Uh, uh, so that was the key that got me into that got me into uh, how does it feel Phil when you go to a match and 80,000 fans are singing your song that's pretty special that's pretty special you can't you can't you, there, there are all kinds of highs you get as a songwriter you know um, you get a song number one in the charts that's a high of course when you, when you would watch it in back in the world on top of the Elvis park. Presley singing one of or your Elvis songs or Elvis Presley singing one of your songs or, 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 or winning the Eurovision song. those are all highs you know or the first time I saw Luke Kelly singing the town of so well in the Albert Hall those are those are our highs. There's no doubt about that. Or or first time you play in, in the White House, you know, first time you play Carnegie. Hall, those are all part of the memory bank, you know. Um, but there's a different there's a different high altogether when you've got a fact a, a complete stadium. Or most recently, a Stade de France, yeah. you know, and they're all they're singing they're singing my song, you know, my words and my music. I mean, uh, some years back when I'd be at uh, Lansdowne Road with, with my my two lads who were then teenagers, just the feeling that when I fall off the perch. And they're going to a rugby match. They'll still be singing the dad song. song. That's a feeling that is that you can't quantify. You know, I mean, that's that's it's kind of heartwarming. We're going to go to a break. Will you sing us into a break, or we'll sing into a break with a verse or two of Ireland call, call you? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, we need some audience participation. We need it. Yes, we do. Come on now. Really go to the break. If I go Ireland, you got to sing Ireland. Yeah. Go. Rory, <laughs> sing up Ireland. Ireland. Good. Come the hour, come the power and, and the glory. We have come to answer our country's call from, from the four proud provinces of Ireland. Come on, Rory. Ireland, Ireland, together stand. Welcome back to my special guest, Phil Coulter. Phil, we mentioned earlier that you sang, you wrote a song for Elvis Presley. That's the pinnacle, is it? Presley <laughs> recording one of your songs. Yeah, especially when, especially when you think that, um, you know, I was saying earlier on, one of my pieces of good fortune was to be born when I was born because in my teenage years, that's when pop music really took light. Um, and Presley's the man who changed the face of all of that. So when I was listening to Elvis Presley singing Hound Dog or Don't Be Cruel, a little beat up radio uh, in the attic bedroom that I shared with my two brothers in a terraced house in Derry. In my wildest dreams, I would never have thought that Elvis Presley would, would, would sing one of my songs. How did he get it? Well, it's quite a story. Um, bear in mind that there's not a songwriter on the planet who wouldn't have sold his children to slavery to get Elvis Presley to sing one of his songs. He would have said, take them by all means, just make sure I get an A-side, you know. Um, I wrote the song initially for Richard Harris. After MacArthur Park, 
which I thought and still do think one of one of the top ten records of all time in my in my collection. It broke every rule in the book. Um, it was seven minutes uh, and twenty seconds long, where a pop record which should have been three minutes, and it was all that very complicated uh, lyrical that people didn't understand and still don't. But MacArthur Park was groundbreaking, and I thought Richard Harris really. I mean, just when he inhabited that song, he brought it to life. And then I thought it was I thought it was a shame that after that. Um, he kind of lost interest in singing. I know he had a fallout with Jimmy Webb, who wrote the song. Yeah. And he went back to making movies, uh, and he and Jimmy Webb didn't speak for 20 years. So I always thought that was a bit of a shame. And um, I used to drink in the same pub in London as uh, as Harris. I was pally with his brother, Dermot. And um, over a period of, of, of months and a lot of drink, I persuaded him to go back in the studio. Because I thought it just, I mean, it's an awful shame that well, that with his talent and his ability to bring to breathe life into a song, that it was a shame that he wasn't doing it any longer. So um, I I wrote My Boy with a, a French a songwriter who's a friend of mine, Claude Francois, who, by the way, just for your information, is the man who wrote My Way. My Way started as a French song called Comme d'habitude. Paul Anka didn't write it. He wrote the English lyric. Paul, oh. People think Paul Anka wrote My Way. He wrote the English lyric, which is no mean feat. But it was written by Claude Francois, my friend. So between us and me, we wrote, uh, we wrote uh, My Way, which I thought was perfect for Harris. So um, I persuaded him um, to go from one of our drinking sessions in, 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 the, in the Elm in, in, uh, in Fulham back to his flat and played him, uh, played him My Boy. And um, whether it was the emotion of, of the song and the fact that he was going through a rocky time in his own marriage but he uh, he fell for the song right away. Um, so we went into the studio and uh, started working on an album, which My Boy was the, was, the, was the title track. Then we toured America, Harris and I. Um, we did like uh, 30 concerts across America with like a 30, 40 piece orchestra. Harris was in his 40s and the whole of his health and he was, he was an Olympic drinker. I have to feel that. So when we come back after six weeks in America, he went back to get making movies. I seriously considered checking myself into rehab <laughs> because it had been a long six weeks. Um, but again, he went back to making movies and I kind of uh, regrouped and, and got myself straight sober. Um, and then, this is a curious story, uh, the middle of the night, months later, I get a call from the songwriter Albert Hammond. Albert Hammond is one of the most prolific of songwriters. He wrote he wrote all the Joe Dolan hits, You're Such a Good Looking Woman, Me or My, blah, blah, blah. I also wrote One Moment in Time, um, The Air That I Breathe, oh. it Never Rains in Southern California. I mean, the hits just kept on coming. Albert and I would have been friends from the, the Denmark Street days. So he's now a big hit songwriter in, in, uh, in America. He calls me from Las Vegas and he said, Phil, woke me up, Phil. I said, yes, Albert. Hey, Albert. He said, this is what he said, excuse the language, you lucky bastard. I said, what's, what's going on? He said, I've just been to see Presley in, in, uh, in, uh, in Vegas, and he's singing your song. I said, you're kidding. He's singing my boy. It was the first I was aware of it. Wow. As I said earlier on, I mean, you know, songwriters would have sold their children into slavery to get close to, to Presley to sing a song because you'd have to get past Colonel Tom Parker, mm -hmm. number one, mm -hmm. who would want a piece of the song. Mm -hmm. Presley would want a piece of the song. There'd be nothing left for you, right? In this case, Presley had heard the song, had heard the Richard Harris version of it, and again, because of the story of the song, and his marriage was come, went through a rocky period, he, he kind of could relate to what the story of the song was, so he wanted to sing it. It was his, to his choice. My goodness. Phil, there's so many things to talk to you about. Billy Connolly, your relationship with Billy Connolly and so on. Let's go back to the basics. You are now in your 82nd year. Yeah, 81. 81. 81. Funny, I was... I was I was on a on a on a pro TV promo thing a few weeks ago, and the, the current tour that I'm on is called Four Score and Then. And the interview, one of those younger ones who's not so smart said, "Is that a musical term?" <laughs> I said, "No, it's my age, you dummy." <laughs> I was eighty last year, so now this is Four Score being eighty, and then yeah. which is the next chapter. What keeps you going today? Why you could retire, you could give it up in the morning. Um, it's the pleasure of and reacting with an audience. I mean, even on the road. You know, I can't say I jump out of bed and go, whoa, we're driving to Letterkenny today, you know, four hours in the rain. It's, that's nothing to savor. But you, you park all of that, you, 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 you kind of brush that aside and you think about, you know, 
uh, the audience that you're going to be playing to um, and how they're going to react to your music and the fact that when I sing uh, my songs on stage and the audience know the song and they join in, that song has become part of their part of their you know part of the landscape, yes. part of their past, part of their their own musical vocabulary. That's a great compliment, number one. But it also is um, a great, I suppose. It's it's a uh, it's the full it's coming full cycle, you know. Um, if I think if I hear people join and sing and steal away, for example, I can remember I can remember sitting down at the piano trying to work that out and coming up with that title. So the gem of an idea that I'll maybe just start with a title and then the journey of the song from an idea, finish the song, finish the lyric, make a little demo, get it recorded initially by the Fury Brothers, and then see the song passing into the public domain. That that kind of journey is 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 exciting and it's kind of heartwarming and it's it's a post it's a valid it's a, it's a valid it's 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 a justification of, of you know the whole role of songwriter. So the word retirement is not in your vocabulary. I keep quoting my hero Clint Eastwood, who's still making movies, still directing movies, movies of a very high caliber at the very highest end, and he's in his early nineties. Clint was asked, "How do you do that at an advanced age? Keep working, keep turning this stuff." Cliff or, or Clint's answer was classic, and it could just as well come from me. I don't let the old man in. Long may that be your mantra. Yeah. Phil, thank you so much for your company pleasure. tonight. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Ladies and gentlemen, Maestro Phil Holter. It's great. Thank you. Thank you.